Well, I mean, I think at the time, everyone was questioning John and wondering why in God's name he was talking to the men and women in violence when all this was happening. And I suppose it was just that moment when I saw him here in the graveyard break down and sob. And, you know, you could see the torture on that man's face. It was probably the most testing time for John Hume because Grey Steel was so horrendous. John was hospitalised for stress. He was risking his health, his own personal reputation and that of his party, the SDLP. He needed his tenacity, his stickability to keep going, to keep trying to persuade the killers that there was an alternative to killing. After months of intense negotiations aimed at breaking the stranglehold of violence in the north, the Taoiseach arrived at Downing Street to sign a wide-ranging and potentially historic accord between the two governments. The Taoiseach and I have now agreed on a joint declaration on Northern Ireland. Just six weeks after Greysteel, the Downing Street Declaration was issued by Prime Minister John Major and Taoiseach Albert Reynolds. Although few would admit it, the wording and core principles of the Declaration were based on ideas thrashed out by John Hume with Gerry Adams in their years of secret talks. It encouraged peaceful self-determination for Northern Ireland, it supported an all-Ireland voice, and it offered Republicans and Loyalists a seat at the negotiating table if they gave up their campaigns of violence. Within a year, there was a ceasefire on both sides. BBC gave the first news to the man whose talks with Gerry Adams have been a key part of the dynamic in all of this. That's it. That's it. That was an extraordinary day in Belfast. I was here working as a reporter and I will never forget the excitement and relief when the news of the ceasefire broke. We'd all been waiting for it for months on end and there'd been endless rumours that it was on, it was off, it was on. In fact, many people believed it would never happen. So when it finally came, it was a moment of real emotion and global importance. Imagine how John Hume felt. Ireland's Prime Minister and the SDLP's John Hume today got Sinn Féin's Gerry Adams to put his name to what they call a total and absolute commitment to peaceful methods. By helping to bring Gerry Adams and Sinn Féin into the political mainstream, Hume risked the possibility that he and his own party, the SDLP, would lose their place as the voice of nationalism. He believed it was a risk worth taking for the greater good. But would it lead to peace or to nothing? The turning point has now been reached with the Canary Wharf bombing. Both the British and Irish governments are increasing pressure on Sinn Féin to condemn the actions of the IRA. Centuries of hatred, mistrust and bitterness were never going to disappear overnight. There was a constant tightrope between fragile ceasefires and permanent peace. And this island needed more than one man to keep hope alive. But things were changing and people's attitudes were changing. Right from the beginning of this process, Hume had always put the emphasis on people, not on land. And he'd been gradually chipping away at their traditional mindsets. Nationalists were changing their attitude to unionists. Unionists were changing their attitude to nationalists. And we in the South were changing our entire attitude to the North. And that was all driven by one man. Good evening from Belfast. On this Good Friday, today is by any standards a truly defining moment in the history of Northern Ireland. After three decades of believing in just one thing, I can only imagine how John Hume felt on the morning of the Good Friday Agreement. It was conceived and endorsed by many incredibly brave people from both traditions, from both parts of this island and from both governments. At last, Hume's three strands were sitting at one table, prepared just to talk to each other. Mr. Hume, and this process, let us underline, is not about victory or defeat for nationalism or unionism. It's about something much greater than that. 
Today we can take a collective breath and begin to blow away, let's hope, the cobwebs of the past. This agreement will now be put... Everyone in the room, especially John Hume, knew that the Good Friday Agreement would be just a worthless piece of paper unless the ordinary people of Ireland supported it. I hereby give notice that the percentage votes given at the referendum was as follows. Yes, 71.12%. A yes vote scarcely ever achieved in a working democracy. In the Republic, with a turnout of 56%, we had a yes vote of 94.4%, a no vote of 5.6%. Historic is a word that's often abused, overused, misused. But to be honest, on that day, I remember everyone who was lucky enough to be involved in what was happening really knew that this was a turning point in all of our lives in Irish history. I remember sitting in studio and being reduced to tears. It was then actually, and it remains now, a deeply emotional moment. How do you feel at this moment? Do you feel emotional? How do you feel? Well, I feel that, uh, as I said during the week to the voters, that uh, yesterday was a very historic day and that they weren't just voting for themselves, they were voting for their children and their grandchildren and for future generations. And by casting their vote, they were doing a very historic thing, a, a yes vote. They would be laying the foundations for the future, the foundations of lasting peace and stability in Ireland, an Ireland which the people, north and south, uh, would have agreed as to how we share this piece of earth together. Little in life is perfect, and peace isn't perfect. Ireland, north or south, isn't perfect. There's still bitterness, still mistrust, still people who feel very alienated and oppressed. But peace is peace. It's what the overwhelming majority of us wanted, it's what we voted for, and it's what we got. Stand on the pavement. Get on the pavement. You're, you're the right... I believe that John Hume not only helped bring about the end of the Troubles in the North, he also helped Ireland rethink our entire 700-year relationship with Britain. And there isn't one part of this island that hasn't benefited. We're all better off, safer, more secure, and that's a mark of the greatness of John Hume, not just as an Irishman, but as a human being. I now call upon the Nobel Peace Prize laureate of 1998, John Hume, to come forward to receive the gold medal and the diploma. One small detail about the Nobel Peace Prize that I think says a lot about the man, when you win the Peace Prize, you also get a large check. So what did John Hume do with it? He gave every cent of it to the local hospice in his native Derry. When John started leading sit-down protests in Derry back in the 60s, campaigning for basic civil rights, the crowds would sing, We Shall Overcome, a song made famous by the American Civil Rights Movement and Dr. Martin Luther King. 30 years later, when John Hume, alongside David Trimble, received his Nobel Peace Prize right here, he closed his acceptance speech with that quote from Martin Luther King. We shall overcome. Thank you. And the wonderful thing for John Hume and for us is that he did overcome. After centuries of conflict, he brought peace to this small island of ours. Something, to be honest, I never thought I'd see in my lifetime. That's why all of us should be eternally grateful to him. And that's why, for me, John Hume is Ireland's greatest. Please vote for John Hume. If you agree with Miriam O'Callaghan and want to vote for John Hume as Ireland's greatest, call 1513 71 7104 or text GREAT followed by the number 4 to 53125. Viewers in Northern Ireland can also text 53125 or call the number on screen. 
Or you can vote now for Michael Collins, Bono, James Connolly or Mary Robinson using their vote numbers on screen. Full details are on RTE Airtel page 197 and online at rte.ie forward slash Ireland's Greatest. Voting will close during the Late Late Show on Friday the 22nd of October when the final results will also be revealed.